Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the live session five of uh, this 2020 AP US government and politics webinar. Um, my name is Paul Sargent, and uh, for a series of nine nights, I'm with you live talking about uh, different uh, information that you're going to need to know, hopefully, uh, on this year's AP government exam that's coming up. Um, and uh, goal over the course of the four nights is to get you an overview of things that you hopefully learned uh, throughout the year. Um, some of you may be in situations where your, uh, where your teacher was, was doing things in a different order, um, which the college board promoted uh, and, and has for many years in this course, um, and found yourself in a situation and your teacher found themselves in a situation where the, they hadn't taught some of the information on the exam. If that's the case, and especially if you're tuning in for the first time, you can go back on this uh, on YouTube, on the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube page, and look back at sessions one through four, um, where we covered the Constitution, we talked about uh, federalism, we talked about the, um, the, the legislative branch and the executive branch, and then tonight we're talking about the judicial branch. Um, so uh, yeah, we're here for uh, nine nights. This is the night number five. So right in the middle here, let's uh, get things moving along. Now, before I get started, I'd like to uh, sort of point out a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, if you're looking for more resources and things to study in, in preparation for this exam, the Bill of Rights Institute has a fantastic website. Um, they have information about key Supreme Court cases that you need to know and documents that you need to know um, and, and, and those things. Um, so go to their website and check it out, BillofRightsInstitute.org. It's fantastic and it's free. Um, and uh, not quite so fantastic, a little more, uh, you know, do-it-yourself kind of thing. Uh, I have a website as well. Um, you can go to sergeantos.com, and I have resources that will help you as well. Um, don't compare it to the Bill of Rights Institute because they're a whole lot better at this than I am. But there's stuff there, and it's free, so if you want to go check it out, go check it out. Um, I should also say now on your uh, YouTube page there that you're watching from, uh, you should see a link um, below the, the video, um, down here, so to speak, um, which talks about, or which is a link to the PDF file that has all of the slides we're going to go over tonight, so you can take them with you or, or uh, do whatever, follow along, however you want to do it. Um, and there is a chat window on the, uh, on the right. And uh, if you have any questions as we go along, please type them into there. And uh, you know that's why we do these things live, is because you can ask these questions and uh, hopefully get them answered, okay? So jumping in here, now we are still, this is night three within uh, what, what the College Board has as unit two, the inter inter interactions among branches of government. And if you've been tuning in for the past few nights, this big idea is going to look very familiar because it's the third night we're talking about it. Because power is widely distributed and checks prevent one branch from usurping power from the others, institutional actors are in a position where they must both compete and cooperate in order to govern. Now, what we've seen as we look through this is widely distributed power. We've talked about powers that belong to the legislative branch, powers that belong to the, uh, to the executive branch. Tonight, we're going to talk about the judicial branch here. And I'm here on location in Washington, D.C., in front of the uh, Supreme Court building. Um, and uh, yeah, so those powers that are, that are uh, distributed are, are really set up so that no one branch becomes too powerful. Um, and there are, there are sort of ways to stop a branch from becoming too powerful. But because of those checks, in order to get anything done, there has to be a system that involves both competition and cooperation. So sometimes groups are going to compete and sometimes groups are going to have to cooperate in order to get anything done. Um, otherwise, people will just be fighting it out the whole time. Now, the college board who writes the AP exam has these two essential questions for this whole unit. Um, you know, and I give them to you because the AP people published them, so it's a good idea to look at them. And second of all, you know, these questions are the big sort of questions that I'm guessing you'll probably see on the AP exam. Um, and again, I've said this every night, but I'm going to say it again tonight. I have no inside information on this AP exam. So if I make predictions about this stuff, this is purely off the top of my head. I have no 
any i have nothing to go on here other than here's what i think would uh be would make sense um so first of all have the branches of government compete and cooperate in order to govern um and again we talked a lot about that the last two nights we're going to finish that up tonight um and then uh to what extent have changes in the powers of each branch affected how responsive and accountable the national government is in the 21st century responsive and accountable uh, are two words that uh, certainly are important here. Um, and, and, you know, I, every night I've talked about uh, what we're all living through right now, this, uh, this coronavirus uh, scare. And, uh, you know, today I actually made it out, uh, went outside um, and, uh, and, and went and, you know, there are were, there were a lot of people. and I've seen uh, news coverage of uh, large gatherings of people now that some of the restrictions are being raised. The decisions to raise those restrictions are going to, uh, you know, show who's responsible or responsive and who's accountable for uh, the outcome of those decisions, both the decisions to shut things down and the, and the decisions to open things up. So tonight we get into the judicial branch and every branch of government in the, in the uh, as the AP uh, people have set it up, has its own enduring understanding. And so this is the one for the court. The design of the judicial branch protects the Supreme Court's independence as a branch of government and the emergence and use of judicial review remains a powerful judicial practice. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the independence of the Supreme Court um, and, uh, and, and its use of judicial review as its big uh, big power that it can use to check the powers of the other branches of the government. Okay, so a little bit about the job. We've talked about this with every other branch of government. Let's talk about it here. Now, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, um, and, uh, and, and those nine justices, there are no constitutional qualifications uh, to get them in. So if you remember from the last two nights, um, to be a congressman, to be a senator, and to be president, the founders laid out um, a few specifics, age, citizenship, and, uh, and, and residency, like where you live. With the Supreme Court and with all other judges, there are no constitutional qualifications. So, um, you know, a person does not have to be, theoretically, again, and, and there's a lot of theory, theoretical but will never happen kind of scenarios, but theoretically, uh, Supreme Court justices could never have seen the inside of a courtroom before they got uh, nominated. I don't know that those type of people will be confirmed by the Senate, but strange things happen. Who knows? But there are no const constitutional qualifications. And they have the, uh, the, the unique circumstance of serving lifetime terms. Now, what this means is not, do you, you know, do you, keep the job until you die, uh, although the answer might be, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, but lots of times uh, justices will choose to, you know, resign and retire and all of that kind of thing. Um, but they have the job um, uh, based on uh, good behavior, as it puts it in the Constitution, um, until, you know, forever. And it, the idea was to take away some of the pressures um, that would be on the other branches of government for responding to the people, um, because this was the judiciary was meant to be sort of a very independent kind of outside of politics place um, to resolve disputes. Um, Emma said, "Emma asked, do you have to be a lawyer before justice?" No, Emma, there are no constitutional qualifications. Although, again, let me make myself clear here: while the Constitution doesn't lay out any uh, any any qualifications here. I, I couldn't see a scenario where someone, where a president would nominate, especially a Supreme Court justice who has never been a lawyer. You know, it just, it just doesn't make sense. So, um, so yes and no. Um, and of course they need to be confirmed by the Senate. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about the arguments that surrounded the constitution in these series, in this series. Um, and uh, the anti-federalists who were lobbying against the passage of the Constitution as it was written, saying that there were some serious flaws that needed to be worked out here, um, pointed to the judicial branch as one of those main flaws. 
the the whole idea that these are unelected people who are going to serve lifetime terms seemed to them uh, a, 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 a sort of like uh, a good breeding ground for uh, overstretching power um, because they don't have to answer to anybody. There's, there's no repercussions in an election if they make an unpopular decision. They can go against the will of the people if they want to um, and never have to really uh, answer for it in any way. Um, and so uh, there were a lot of reservations that the anti-federals had about, uh, uh, about the judicial branch. Now their power and the power of the judicial branch comes from a few places, all right? Number one, their main power is the power of judicial review. Um, they have, the, the courts have the power to determine whether laws are constitutional or not. Um, and then, you know, do they violate the constitution or are they in line with the constitution? Um, if they violate the constitution, the, uh, the courts have the ability to uh, strike down the law um, or part of a law um, and, and say that it does not, you know, that, that it violates the constitution, therefore cannot exist anymore. Um, and, and they've done that many, 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 many times. All right, so the other uh, source of judicial power comes from Article Three, which is very short. The founders didn't spend a lot of time on writing about exactly what the court could do. They kind of created it, and they said that the, the Congress could create, other, you know, they created a Supreme Court, and Congress could create whatever other courts it needed. So Congress has created a whole series of lower courts. Um, and then it gave a few specific uh, uh, areas of jurisdiction to the Supreme Court itself. Um, now, you don't need to know these at all for the AP exam, but you know something like um, like uh, instances that involve an ambassador of the United States to another country, they don't go to any courtroom other than straight to the Supreme Court. Um, so there, there are a few of those cases laid out there. Um, uh, let's see, we have a few questions. Haley says, does the president appoint the justices? Yes, Haley, he appoints the justices um, at, every level, at, at every level. And I'm going to say every level over and over and over because I want you to remember this is not just the Supreme Court that we're talking about. There's a whole federal court system. Um, and Aliana, welcome back again. Why are there so little justices? Why just nine? I'll tell you why. Because that's what they decided. I know it's a horrible answer, but like that's the best one there is. I mean, nine is not a bad number. It's an odd number, which is good because if you, you know if you had an even number of, number of justices, you could have some problems arise. Um, but uh, it's an odd number. There aren't too many of them. Um, but it's not like there are three people sitting there or two people sitting there, you know. Um, so yeah, they just kind of came at nine and landed on it and it seemed to work. Um, the, another source of, source of judicial power, and it's not like, a, it's not a formal source, but it comes from Federalist number 78. We're gonna talk about this in a few minutes, um, which in which uh, uh, James Madison wrote about the, um, the, the sort of the powers of the judicial branch within this system to try and fight against the arguments of the anti-federalists. Um, and then another source of their judicial power comes from their own Supreme Court decision of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes, okay? So let's talk about some of these things. Federalist number 78. Um, usually when we talk about the Federalist Papers, uh, you know, people tend to point to uh, 10 and 51, which talked about, uh, you know, a, a republic and separation of powers and checks and balances. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the less looked at ones, but the College Board puts, has this as one of their foundational documents, which means that you need to, you need to be familiar with it. Um, and, and with all of these, what I would suggest, if you haven't studied these foundational documents that, we, that we've talked about, um, I would spend a little bit of time and go back and, and, and read them. And, you know, at this point, I would say just Google, you know, Federalist number 78 excerpt or something, and then kind of read a shortened version of 
these Federalist Papers. Um, but basically, the argument was this, the judiciary would be the weakest branch of government. Um, this is why they spent so little time. Uh, you know, part of the anti-federalist argument was, hey, guys, there's there's not really much written about this judicial branch in the Constitution. So, like, the less you write, um, you know, the, the more problems we might have with this thing. Um, but he argued that the, ju the judiciary would be the weakest branch. And the reason he said it would be the weakest branch is because it doesn't have the power of the sword or the purse. In other words, what he was saying is that enforcement of law, the sword, the real, uh, you know, the military and, and all that kind of stuff, that exists under the executive branch. And the executive branch can have power based on its power of the sword, its power to make things happen. Um, Congress has the power of the purse. They, they control the flow of money. They can fund things. They can choose not to fund things. Um, and so, you know, that gives them a great deal of power. It's hard to do things if you don't have money. It's easy to do things if you're given plenty of money to do it. But the, the court system has neither of those pow <clears throat> powers. Excuse me. And so uh, Madison kind of insinuated and, and talked about the fact that, that the court system would have to rely on the other branches to, uh, you know, to work with it in its decisions. But he also laid out that the intention of what they wrote, even though they didn't write it into the Constitution, was uh, the power of the courts to have judicial review and to determine whether the weather laws were constitutional or not. Now, the problem that arose was this. It's judicial review is not written into the Constitution. Yes, Madison talked about that was the intention of the whole thing in these Federalist Papers, but the Federalist Papers in themselves don't hold any constitutional weight um, in terms, I mean, they hold weight as argument and as explanation, but they don't hold weight as in actual law. So simply saying what we were trying to do is give them judicial review, and let's talk about what that means, and writing it into the document or writing into the Constitution are two very, very different things. And so what happened very early on in our republic was a challenge to the, uh, you know, to the court system. And this this uh, court case uh, was Marbury versus Madison, uh, arguably the most important court case in, in our entire course. Um, yeah, and we can make arguments for other ones, but this one kind of set up every other court case. So I kind of take it as one of the big ones. Um, and it is a required Supreme Court case. Uh, so, so you should know this one. Um, and really what this was is this was a dispute between uh, Marbury who had been uh, given a, a um, given a uh, given a job by the Adams administration, and like the night that they were uh, moving out of the White House, kind of thing, the night before uh, uh, Jefferson's inauguration, um, and James Madison, who uh, was uh, who under Jefferson was in charge of distributing these these jobs, which had been sort of written down. Um, Madison didn't give Marbury his job. Marbury sued him, um, and the case went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, let's face it, was in a tough decision, did, was in a tough position. Um, the Chief Justice John, John Marshall, he had to sit there and decide like how he was going to get around uh, the problem of, you know, of, of this court case, you know? What should they do? Well, what they ended up doing, and there's a long story behind this case, and, and I don't want to go into all the details of it. Um, they did confirm by a uh, decision that they, as the Supreme Court, had the power to determine the constitutionality of law. So basically, they decided that they had that power in a decision where they used that power. And since they had that power and used that power, they've had the power since then, even though it's not written into the Constitution word for word, if that makes, I hope that made sense, um, you know. Um, and, and so basically what this court decision did is it gave the judiciary its big check on other branches. 
this is the this is the one. And if so, if you ever are talking in any essay about checks and balances, and you go to the courts and you go, wow, now what is it the courts have over the other two branches? Well, it's it's this, it's judicial review. That is like you just go for that one and stick with that one and talk it out um, because that's their big uh, weapon. Okay. So how do they go about making their decisions? Um, now, courts uh, all across the land uh, make decisions based upon a certain set of principles um, that they all follow. First of all is precedent. Um, courts will decide along the lines of the way similar cases have been ruled on in the past. Um, and if you ever end up going to law school and going to it, you'll spend a lot of time learning about precedent, learning about court cases. And if you ever find yourself in a courtroom or preparing someone to go into a courtroom, you're going to be looking back at precedent saying, here's a case which was similar to this one and it was ruled this way. And that's the way that it would favor my client. And the other side is going to look for cases which are similar, which were ruled in a different way, you know. And realizing that there are no two cases which are absolutely the same. It just, does, there are special circumstances to every single case. But you rely on precedent, what came before. And so this leads to uh, the court practice of what's called stare decisis. Um, and stare decisis is a fancy Latin term um, to let the precedent stand unless there's compelling reasons to overturn them. Um, uh, so, you know, unless something has radically changed or unless um, the decision was obviously outdated or wrong or you know something like that, then you don't overturn the decision, especially especially at the Supreme Court level. Now, what you have here on, on the right of, uh, side of this slideshow is, is a picture from uh, the Brown versus Board of Education uh, case in 1954. And this is like the I don't know, the, the showcase uh, case of when the Supreme Court has overturned past, one of its past decisions. So in 1896, in a court case, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, the Supreme Court had decided that separate but equal facilities were allowable. They were constitutional um, as long as they were s separate but equal. Um, and so what came out of that court decision in 1896 was decades and decades of segregation that was backed up by, um, by a Supreme Court decision, uh, an interpretation of uh, the meaning of the 14th Amendment. And as, um, as, uh, as the 20th century moved on um, and as uh, the early part of the civil rights movement was, was getting going, um, the Supreme Court looked at this again, and they decided that in, in uh, you know, a very famous decision that separate is inherently unequal. When you take a group of people and you separate them by law, you, in, you even if everything else is equal, just doing that thing creates inequality. Um, and so they overturned the decision. Um, and, and struck down the separate but equal doctrine that which had existed, you know, for like almost 60 years at that point. Um, Layla asked, was the reason the South Carolina said they had no authority because it was supposed to be an appellate judge, not the Supreme Court? Wait, wait was the reason the Supreme Court said they had no authority because it was supposed to be an appellate judge, not the Supreme Court? Uh, Layla, I'm not sure what what your what your the question is about. Um, so I, I'm going to have to bypass that one. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Try and clarify a little bit and I'll try and answer your question as best you can, as best I can. Um, so there have also been times when ideological, ideological changes happen. I mean, you have to understand the judges are not just justices around the country. Judges around the country are very prestigious and all of that. They're very you know, well read, but they are not sort of people that rise above humanity or anything like that. They're people just like you and me, and they have things they believe in and they have ways that they see the world. And those ideologies that they have um, can change over time. 
Now, what happens is presidents will tend to appoint justices that share their ideologies. If their ideologies are a little bit more on the extreme, in other words, you don't have some super moderate president, um, then the makeup of the Senate is going to determine how extreme their, uh, their judges are. If, if, for example, a Republican uh, president has a Democratic Senate, he might want to, want to uh, appoint a very conservative justice to the Supreme Court, but realize that the Democratic Senate won't approve that person. And so then we'll maybe go with someone who is a little bit more moderate, not moderate, moderate, but a little bit more moderate and moderate enough that, he, that the president can get the votes to confirm this justice. But they appoint justices who agree with what the presidents believe. And so as these appointments come in over time, the appointments can change the ideological balance on the court. Um, and, and what had been um, sort of a swing court for a very long time uh, in the United States has moved into a conservative court so that there are really five conservative votes on the Supreme Court right now. Um, and four fairly liberal votes on the Supreme Court. Um, and so the big question that, I mean, we won't really know the answer to for, you know, 15 or 20 years, probably at least definitively, is how conservative is this court going to be and how far are they gonna go in overturning the more liberal decisions of the past 50 years on the Supreme Court? Um, uh, Haley asks, did the justices or do the judges have to be assigned to a political party? No, I mean, ju justices do not, they're not part of a political party. They, they may have a history with a political party and certainly they are going to uh, share beliefs with a political party. But again, but they're not gonna act within that, like they're not gonna be overtly political um, in, in any way. You won't see Supreme Court justices, for example, um, on the news or on the campaign trail or something. You know, it is, it's just not done. Um, but their politics and their beliefs are going to shape the way that they view different circumstances um, when they hear cases uh, and all of that. So they're not really assigned to a political party or anything like that, although you can. So that's why, I guess. When, when people talk about the Supreme Court, they don't talk about Republican and Democratic justices, they talk about conservative and liberal justices. Um, and because, you know, they've it, it, sort of risen above that. Plus, if you have a lifetime appointment, your views can change over time. And, you know, there's, there's not a lot people can do about it. Um, you know, there have been justices in the past who, were appointed based on the assumption that they were going to rule on cases one way. Um, and then they ended up kind of in their untouchable jobs, changing their views and ruling differently than would have been predicted when they were initially uh, nominated. All right. So now when you have changes in ideology, those changes can lead to overturning precedent. This is what I was talking about. So if, for example, let's just say we have, a, we have a conservative Supreme Court now, they start looking at some of the liberal court decisions of the 1960s and 70s, and they start looking at them and saying, well, you know, yeah, not sure that we should continue to do that. Well, they may have the five votes to overturn past Supreme Court decisions and vastly change the way that our lives um, uh, exist. That doesn't mean they will. And that doesn't mean that they won't. Um, the one big one that, uh, you know, sort of is always hanging out there and the one that uh, a lot of people are, are starting to uh, talk about now is a challenge to, uh, to the case that, that banned uh, uh, restrictions on abortion uh, in, in the early part of the pregnancy, um, the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, is that going to be overturned now that there are five conservative justices on the court um, and people who want pro-choice are very concerned that that might happen. And people who are pro-life um, are kind of hoping that that will happen. Um, and then, you know, but we'll see. Like, I don't know. Um, 
It also can lead to establishing new precedents about things that uh, never existed before, problems or, that arise that may not have existed in the past for some reason or may not have come in front of the Supreme Court for some reason um, can be established. And then those precedents will be used not only by future Supreme Courts, but also by all of the lower courts who will create decisions on similar cases based on the precedent coming down to them in the Supreme Court, if that makes sense. All right. Now, this does lead to a question of legitimacy. Boy, speaking about abortion, there it is right there. Um, because legitimacy of the court as a branch of government is something that, um, that gets a lot of airtime. Um, and, and really, I mean, both parties have their issues with the Supreme Court and have over time had issues with the Supreme Court. Um, as with most other things, what ends up happening is that if the court makes a decision which is fairly conservative, then Democrats will get very infuriated and talk about how the court is taking its powers way beyond what it should. And it, you know, it doesn't have any business ruling in this case. Um, and if the court makes a liberal decision, uh, politicians and talk show hosts and stuff will start talking about how the court has gone way beyond its, uh, its powers here and, and how it's made decisions that you know, are outside of what it should be doing and all of that. Um, so it, it tends to be that the people who lose ideologically in a court case are the ones who are upset about the power that the court has. Um, and then when their side gets a win in the Supreme Court politically, then they're very supportive of the Supreme Court, um, you know, for the next time they lose. And it goes back and forth. Now, the court itself is famously independent and secretive. Um, they don't. They don't uh, have any keep any records of their deliberations, where the justices talk about um, why they're ruling uh, one way or another, and sort of uh, have free flow of ideas. Um, they don't hold press conferences. They don't. Uh, you, you know, they, they they're very secretive, and they lead a lot. Uh, they leave a lot of their uh, discussions and and those sorts of things uh, inside of you know, the, the Supreme Court chambers um, in order to protect that independence. Um, they don't back uh, uh, candidates for president. They don't, you know, they don't, they, they don't act politically in any way. Um, they sort of hold themselves outside of that whole thing and, and try to be, I think, see themselves as being impartial, although no one is impartial, you know. Um, but sometimes decisions are unpopular. The, the decision to uh, legalize abortion was, and not completely, but we'll just go with it as shorthand, um, was very, very, very controversial and very unpopular with conservatives at the time and continues to be uh, unpopular with conservatives who believe that this is a violation of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the way that things should be um, based on their ideas um, and, and people who our pro-choice, I've said, are very happy to have the ability uh, to have access to this. But anytime there are unpopular decisions, then people start talking about what's the power of this branch, which has, which, which, where people have not been elected by the people of the United States, um, and they are ruling in ways which can change our lives immensely. Um, it, and you know, people can get very upset about this. I mean, if you think about it, in a true sense, a Supreme Court justice is appointed by a person who is not elected by the people of the United States, but who is elected by members of the Electoral College who represent the people of the United States. So they're like separated from the voters by three waves. You know, here's the voter, goes the Electoral College member who votes for the president, who appoints the Supreme Court justice. And then it's confirmed by the Senate, which is directly elected by the people, um, but uh, in, you know, but sort of longer terms and all those sorts of things. So you know, how legitimate is this that we can actually have this? Is a question that comes up, and you will hear a lot. Um, the reality is that the that, that Congress and the President can affect um, the impact of these decisions um, if they don't agree 
with the way the court ruled on something, that doesn't mean it's like the end of the road. If Congress goes through and passes some some bill, some law, which is like, you know, they think is going to be like the greatest thing in the world, and then the Supreme Court finds that it's unconstitutional, it's not the end of the road here, people. It's not like they just are going to throw their hands up in the air, get infuriated, and then go home and talk about how they almost had made a change which would make America awesome, you know, and all that. No, there are things that they can do to affect the impact of decisions. They can't change the decisions. They can't overrule the decisions, but they can change the impact of them, okay? Now, before we do that, um, I want to talk about where a lot of the real controversy comes around uh, with the Supreme Court is at what level should the Supreme Court be involved in making policy? In theory, um, many people think they should they should act as referees in uh, like a football game. You know, they're going to stand on the sideline. They're going to watch everything go down. Um, when they see something that goes wrong, then they're going to throw a flag and call a foul. Um, and sometimes they don't. Um, so, you know, this is an ongoing debate and it has been since almost the very beginning as to what role the court should play um, in the making of policy. Sometimes um, there are waves of judicial activism, okay? And judicial activism is when uh, justices on the court are willing to use the court to make or change policy that wouldn't be changed by the other branches of government. Okay, um, and and one of the court decisions, which was seen at the time as a very activist decision, um, was was uh, the case of uh, Miranda versus Arizona. Um, this is Miranda right here, um, and uh, and giving us what you and I know from watching TV and seeing movies as our Miranda rights, um, that we have to be informed of our right to remain silent um, and told that anything that we say can and will be used against us and um, that we have the right to an attorney um, and that if we, uh, you know, if we can't afford one, one will be provided to us, you know. Um, the argument against that was that no, there was going to be no action in terms of Congress writing laws saying that this had to be done. Um, but it certainly makes the job of the police more difficult if a defendant or a person is arrested and doesn't know they have those rights, then they're going to, you know, maybe talk to the police and answer their questions and they may never ask for a lawyer. Um, and then, you know, they don't have a real good shot at getting, uh, you know, you know, going home at the end of the day, uh, like Miranda, uh, Ernesto Miranda did. Um, but, uh, but the Supreme Court at the time thought that it was more important to protect the rights of the individuals. And even if it meant making the job of the police and the courts a little bit more difficult, um, that to protect the rights of the individual who's been accused of a crime uh, was more important. And so now we're read our Miranda rights so that if you, rem you, know, if you forget because, you know, whatever reason, uh, they, they'll remind you, oh, yeah, you don't have to say anything. And if you want to judge, all you have to do is ask for one. And, uh, you know, we can bring yours if you can afford it. And if you can't, well, then, you know, we're going to we'll get you one, basically. Um, and then there are other times where uh, justices practice judicial restraint um, in which they make their decision only based on constitutionality, um, not in any sort of move to make policy um, uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to it. Um, the, uh, the part of judicial restraint, um, which is like you'll see it most often, is when the Supreme Court will rule on a case and they will make very specific, and you're not gonna run into these sort of cases in, a, in like an AP government course. Um, but many times they'll rule on a case and they'll make it very clear that the, this ruling will not apply to cases like this one. They are just ruling on this one particular situation. 
um, and so don't. And then uh, there are other times where they make, you know, sort of broad statements of, you know, this kind of has to be done. Um, Haley asks, uh, what amendment are the Miranda rights connected to? Haley, I'm going to leave you a cliffhanger there because we're going to be going over those, this case and others in one, two, three nights, I believe, two nights, um, one of the two. It's either it's either uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, so be sure to, to to check in, and and you'll get this and a whole lot of others. All right, so if we have a Supreme Court which does something which is unpopular, what checks exist against the Supreme Court? If you're talking about the Supreme Court's check on other branches, it's an easy one. There's one judicial review. We spent a lot of time talking about it, but checks on the Supreme Court by other branches. There are a number of things because remember, as Madison said, the court doesn't have the power of the sword or the power of the purse. So what checks exist? Well, congressional legislation. If, for example, Congress passes a law, uh, you know, whatever, mandating uh, uh, mandatory preschool across the United States, let's start school age a year earlier. So preschool is going to be mandatory across the United States. Um, then the Supreme Court would look at that, and then maybe they say, well, you know, um, this is unconstitutional for, you know, reasons A, B, and C, blah, blah, blah. Um, Congress can go back and pass the exact same law and simply change A, B, and C a little bit, and then get done what they really want to get done in a slightly different way. So congressional legislation can change court. It's not going to, like, get rid of the court decision, but they can make new laws, which are very similar to the laws which were overturned, but are, but bypass those areas that the Supreme Court had issue with. Um, in a more extreme case, and obviously this doesn't happen very often, but constitutional amendments can be a complete check on the court. Um, uh, you know, there was a, a case uh, back in the 19th century, uh, Dred Scott versus Sanford, in which uh, the Supreme Court decided that that um, that uh, African Americans had no rights in the United States and could not sue in court, um, and, and, and but called them slaves. Slaves have no rights, um, and so the Congress, you know, a few years later. Um, uh, passed and the states ratified uh, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. So all of a sudden, like, okay, slaves don't have any rights to uh, in court, but now there's no slaves, so kind of did away with that court decision, you know. They can make constitutional amendments which are straight up against uh, the court decision. For example, we've discussed uh, abortion here. Um, it's too divisive of an, of an issue for this to be a reality. But let's go into a sort of a, an alternate reality for a second. Um, let's say both houses of Congress decide that, that they want overwhelmingly to end the availability of abortions, to ban abortions in the United States. Well, if two thirds of the House votes OK on that one, a simple constitutional amendment saying that uh, abortions of any kind are illegal in the United States, or, you know, however they might word that. Um, and two thirds of the Senate agrees. Then they send it out to all of the states and if three fourths of the states come back and they agree with it, then Roe v. Wade as a decision and abortion as a practice is gone. Um, the reason that that hasn't happened is because it's a very divisive issue and there's not, I mean, there's not nearly that much support for banning abortions. We're talking about two thirds of both houses of Congress and then three fourths of the states. It, the, the votes just aren't there. Um, in fact, it's probably not even close to anywhere for that. So, um, so it's never done this way, but constitutional amendments certainly because once it's an amendment to the constitution, it's part of the constitution and part of the constitution cannot be ruled unconstitutional because it's part of the constitution and by definition is constitutional. All right. Um, judicial appointments can check the court, uh, check the court. Um, as we've talked about, you know, if the court is leaning one way, um, uh, well, for now, we have a we have a conservative court. Um, if we have uh, if we have a Democratic president 
in 2020 or 2024 or 2028, somewhere down the road. Um, and one of the Republican uh, uh, justices retires or, you know, whatever, dies, um, then uh, that Democratic president could uh, dominate a, and, and get on the court a more liberal justice and could theoretically then shift it back to a, to a liberal court, you know, and that liberal court would then possibly, again, possibly, overturn some of the decisions of a more conservative court. Kind of goes back and forth uh, as it goes along. Um, um, okay, uh, Layla, I, there's a question here about Mar. I, I would look to uh, the Marbury versus Madison decision was a Supreme Court decision, and they did rule on it. They just they they kind of went around a direct ruling for Marbury or for Madison and they more ruled for themselves. They ruled that the law which gave the Adams administration the right to give Marbury his job was an unconstitutional law. And so therefore the job could never have been given. So therefore Marbury had no case in forcing, in, in to have them force Madison to give him a job was basically what they did. Um, we're talking about the Marbury versus Madison, which I guess made sense if you were following along with that. So I hope that helps, Layla. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, just kind of look over that one. Because um, it is, I mean, it's a complicated court case when you get into the specifics of exactly what happened. For our purposes, just know it was about judicial review. Um, courts can also be checked by a lack of implementation. Um, the, the, the executive branch could simply not follow through on whatever uh, the court says, you know. Famous example of this uh, came back during uh, the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Um, he was going to move uh, Native American tribes from uh, Georgia out to the Oklahoma territories forcefully. Um, the, the, an appeal was made to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that he could not, uh, you know, that, that this move would be unconstitutional to force these people to move. Um, and uh, Andrew Jackson basically said, well, if the court wants to enforce their own ruling, let them do it. Otherwise, in the absence of that, I'm going to have these people move from Georgia to Oklahoma. And they did. Um, and then it became known as, known as the Trail of Tears. It's not one of the, you know, the great stories of American history. Um, but, uh, but basically, the president just simply ignored uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court and went on and did what he wanted to do. So, you know, not implementing a decision is certainly uh, out there. And then you can change, uh, Congress can change uh, the jurisdiction of courts, um, largely at the lower court level um, as to where, what they can rule on and those sorts of things, um, which would be minor changes, but can provide some check on what the court is able to do and what it's not able to do. Um, uh, as it's set up. All right. So uh, we're going to, that's, that's really kind of the Supreme Court or, or the court system in a nutshell here. Um, when, when you're looking at this, guys, what I want you to really understand, and, and, and this is a misconception that my students have year after year, and you may not have it, I don't know, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, I used the analogy a little bit ago of the referee in a uh, in a football game throwing a flag on a play and then calling a foul. Um, and a lot of people think that that's how the Supreme Court works. They kind of hold back and they watch. Anytime there's a law, like they're going to look over it, a law is passed, and then they're going to throw the, throw down the flag if they think there's something wrong with it. And that's not the case. Okay, the court system, the Supreme Court is like any other court that's out there. There has to be a case that comes up um, for the court to do anything about it. Someone has to be uh, have an issue with someone else that involves this thing. Um, so uh, a better analogy would be perhaps an official in a football game standing there watching the game, or maybe not even watching the game, 
And then at some point there, a foul occurs. So the person who was fouled then stops the game, or maybe the game keeps going while they do this, and they go over to the referee and they complain that they were fouled on the play. And then the referees will maybe get together and they'll talk to this person, they'll talk to him, and they'll talk to the person who fouled him. And then maybe they'll go back and look at the instant replay and all of that. And then, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe an hour after the play, maybe a few days later, they'll decide that there was a foul on that play. And so the outcome of that play was going to be uh, nullified and, um, you know, and then, you know, who knows what would happen from there with the game, but you get kind of the idea. Um, so the Supreme Court is not sort of like uh, constantly watching and ruling on cases. Cases have to be brought to them, um, and then they can choose to rule on cases or not. Uh, this is another thing that they do. They, they can choose not to rule on a case, uh, or they can choose not to hear a case because they don't have time to hear everything that comes across their desk. Um, but, uh, but they are the ones who determine the constitutionality of laws and this gives them their big power in, uh, in our American system. All right. All right. So that brings us to the end, ladies and gentlemen, um, tomorrow night, we are going to, uh, tackle what many people call the fourth branch of government. Um, which was not much at the beginning of when, you know, in the early days of our Republic, but which today has grown to a workforce of over 2 million people um, carrying out all kinds of jobs, the federal bureaucracy. Um, so that's kind of it for night five of our, of the Bill of Rights Institute's uh, webcast for the U.S. government of politics exam. Um, I hope that you guys are, are getting a good refresher on some of this stuff, and I hope that you're going to uh, continue to tune in. Um, all of the past uh, episodes are there on YouTube for you to check out um, at your leisure. And uh, that's about all I have for you. So uh, I'll see you tomorrow night, same time, 8 o'clock. And uh, for the Bill of Rights Institute, my name is Paul Sargent. Be safe out there, and have a great night. See you tomorrow.